thank you all for having me. Uh, yeah, so this is a very brief tour of the magic behind Spark. I only have 20 minutes, so we will leave a lot of the magic behind. It's very sad. Uh, and my co-presenter today is Boo. Uh, she is wearing her witch's hat for, for the magic part. Um, she, she's very, she likes magic a lot. Uh, yeah. Um, so my name is Holden. My preferred pronouns are she or her. It's tattooed on my wrist, in case you forget. Um, and I'm a principal software engineer at IBM Spark Technology Center in San Francisco. I like it. They give me money to work on open source. Um, I'm a Spark committer, but I mostly work on Python. So if things are broken, I will blame someone else. Um, if they work, I will take credit. Um, and I've worked at a bunch of other companies before IBM on a bunch of distributed system stuff. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's just my name, Holden Caro. Um, right now, it's mostly someone being kind of really sad about living in America. Um, and the slides from today and my other talks will go on SlideShare. Um, and uh, I have some other Spark videos. Um, if you want to see a longer version with more magic, uh, you, can, you can find different magic on YouTube uh, in some of my other talks. Um, and just to be like super clear, um, I added this slide after the American election, which made me really sad. Um, but I'm trans, I'm queer, I'm Canadian, I'm on a work visa where I, where I live. Um, and it's one they're talking about taking away, uh, so that's fun. Um, and I consider myself a part of the broader leather community. Um, and this is really just like, I mean, if you don't know other people like me, we're, we're normal people, we write the same shitty spark jobs that you do. Uh, we get out of memory exceptions. I don't have a secret Java garbage collector that I'm hiding from you, right? Like, we're all just software developers and we're, we're nice people, or I mean, close enough, right? <clears throat> Um, this is my employer. Uh, they give me money, so they get a slide. Um, we have this uh, very nice-looking lobby with a lot of green in it, which is supposed to indicate that we make good software, um, because green is the color of a passing Jenkins build. Um, so a green lobby means that your software totally works. Uh, if you're ever considering buying something from IBM, I don't know what it is we sell anymore, but please buy it. Um, yeah, whatever the, yeah. Uh, oh, and I'm not alone. Like, I work with a bunch of other people on Spark, and, and they're nice people as well. Um, so we're going to talk about, oh, wait. I'm going to assume you're nice people. You've laughed at many of my really crappy jokes, so we're off to a good start. Um, I am really curious, though, how many people are completely new to Apache Spark? Is this anyone's first Spark talk? OK, cool. Um, this talk is probably not the best introduction to Spark, um, because we, we try and look behind the covers a little bit. Hopefully, you'll still find it useful. Um, but you probably want to check out Paco's introduction to Spark talk after this, if I don't scare you away from using Spark. Um, <laughs> How many people are like diehard R users? Really? OK. Uh, how many people are diehard R users that don't use Python? Oh, thank god. OK. Um, so all of the examples are in Scala or Python. Uh, so good. Uh, I don't know R well enough yet. So for the people who are new to Spark, why, why should you be thinking about Spark? Um, so I think a lot of people come to Spark because they have a MapReduce job. Uh, they're running it. And 16, well, eight hours into their 16, 24-hour job, they're like, I bet I can learn Spark before this finishes. Um, and yes, you can. You can learn Spark in the time it takes a MapReduce job to run. Um, the API is pretty simple. Um, the other reason that people come is their data frames stop fitting in their MacBook Pro's main memory. And they're like, the solution to this problem is distributed systems. And now they have n problems. Um, but on the other hand, their code might work. Uh, so hopefully, one of these things is relevant to you. But the reason we're all here today is magic. Yay! OK, cool. Let's do some magic. Um, so there's a lot of magic that makes Spark as a distributed system like work, uh, or like compute your answers. Um, the DAG and the query planner are really like 
the core building block of the magic of Spark. It's the part which lets this optimizer do all sorts of really cool things. Um, Spark is lazily evaluated, and as a result, Spark doesn't actually do the things we ask it to do until we absolutely force it, kind of like a really lazy 16-year-old um, who's like, yeah, 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 I took out the garbage. Oh, fine, okay, you want to go check, I'll actually take out the garbage. Um, but unlike your lazy 16-year-old, um, Spark is able to use this to do pipelining and combine a lot of steps uh, and save time. Um, the other thing which I think is really important as a distributed system is Spark's resiliency model is a little bit different uh, than some other traditional distributed systems. Uh, so it depends on recompute rather than sort of traditional resiliency of saving results out to a bunch of different machines. Uh, and this is really important because the only thing slower than a disk is three disks over a network. Um, and that's sort of the traditional resiliency model. Um, and we can also do interesting operations without deserialization because someone spent too much time uh, drinking. Um, and we'll, we'll look at some of these different pieces of magic. But we're not going to cover all of them. Um, there was a really lovely talk yesterday which talked about some of the stuff happening in the shuffle and some other magic. Um, it wasn't called magic for some reason, but I mean, artistic differences, I respect that. Um, if you missed that talk, I have a GoTo Chicago talk which talks about some of the same things, and, and you should watch that. Um, but yeah, so the, the reason we all use Spark is that our data is magically distributed across our cluster along with our work. Um, at some point, our RDD or our data frame, the, our distributed collection, is forced to exist, right? If Spark was able to never do any work, I mean, you could just not write your software to begin with, and it would run much faster. Um, you probably wouldn't get paid as much, but you know, it would be perfectly fine. Um, but when this happens, it's really important that our data is distributed. But there's this catch that Spark tries to understand where our data is to, to some degree. Um, and this is done with this thing called partitioners. And in Spark, normally, uh, when we load our data in, it doesn't really understand what the layout of our data is, but if we need to do something like a join or if we need to sort our data, Spark has to understand where the different keys for our data are, and partitioners are deterministic. And this deterministic nature of partitioners breaks some of the really cool magic, right? Our, our magically distributed collection that I can pretend just works starts to have some constraints. Um, so when I say magically distributed, what we actually mean is that each of these gnomes is responsible for some of my data. Um, and when I, ask these, when I ask my Spark cluster to do some work, each of these 300 gnomes are going to go off and do that little work on their own. But once I like, want to get my keys in order, these gnomes have to talk to each other to figure out, like, hey, which, which pieces of the data do you have? Which pieces of the data do you have? And at that point, we start trying to assign gnomes different pieces of the data to deal with specifically, rather than each just giving them like some random set of records. The problem is, we might give one of those gnomes the responsibility for the null key. And at that point, that gnome gets really sad because most of your data is null because the client lied to you. Or they didn't lie, but they told you their data was evenly distributed. What they meant is the data where my keys exist is evenly distributed. And then our gnome responsible for the null key goes on a bender and just doesn't come back, and then our job fails because we have this very sad gnome. Or actually, the, the gnome fails, then we try it on another gnome, and then we try it on another gnome, and now we have three dead gnomes. And <laughs> thankfully, gnomes don't count, um, but you know things, things start to go poorly. Um, at this point. And so yeah, this is, this is the key skew problem. It's, it's the sort of part where Spark's magic distribution of data stops working. Um, and my traditional example for this is handlebar mustaches, um, because as someone that lives in San Francisco, I, I mean, software is great. I make a lot of money on software. It's pretty good. Um, but there's this thing where I have to do work, and that's just like not really my style. Um, so I want to get out of the software business and start selling mustache wax to people. Um, and there, are, normally, there's someone. I, you, you have a pretty good mustache. Okay. Normally, there's someone in the front row with like a really rocking mustache, and we can we can talk. But in, in this case. Um, I want to know where I should be opening my mustache wax shop. So I've got this, this data, um, and this is American zip codes, right? Um, and you have postal codes that I assume 
have the same problems. Um, but so once I try and sort my data, it's, it's going to go really poorly, right? Um, but that was talked about yesterday. So we're going to talk about what happens if I try and call group by key in my data. I might be trying to figure out, like, I want to send some really high quality targeted marketing uh, to all of the people in whichever zip code has the most handlebar mustaches, because that's where I'm going to open my mustache wax shop. So I'm going to take my RDD, I'm going to call group by key on it, and then things are going to go fabulously. <clears throat> OK, well, the problem is when we call group by key, Spark creates this RDD where it's this key and this list of all of the records for that key. And then afterwards, I can do some type of arbitrary transformation on that RDD. Um, and that's great, but we think this shouldn't be too bad, right? Because Spark's optimizer doesn't actually have to make that RDD exist until we get to the point where we save it out to disk or you know, I start sending out my flyers to all of the people about my mustache wax shop. Um, the problem is that Spark can't see inside of our Lambda expressions. Um, and this is, this is like the limitation of the magic of Spark. Um, once we, all of our maps, our flat maps, all of the things that we do, Spark can understand what we're asking it to do, except it can't see inside of what we ask it to do. So let's, uh, okay, I'm gonna go to this one really quickly. So the problem is that Spark can't see inside of this Lambda expression. Um, so it doesn't know that we want the counts here, right? Even though it's able to delay the computation until we save this result out to disk, Spark isn't able to move this counting up above grouping the values together by key. Because really what we want to do is, as we're going through for each zip code, I want to be keeping track of the number of people who are in the zip code that I can send these high quality advertisements to. But because it can't see inside of my Lambda, Spark just, it, it, the magic breaks, and then Boo gets very sad. Um, and and this, this, this happens again. Um, so key skew plus black boxes equals sadness. Um, but it's, it's okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna make this work. We're gonna do, well, okay, we're gonna see an example with literally kilobytes of data because I ran this on an airplane um, rather than a real cluster. But we can see I've got some input data, it's 385 kilobytes, um, and my shuffled read is 48 kilobytes. But if instead, for my handlebar mustache wax shop, I replaced this with reduce by key um, or aggregate by key and was computing like the number of people who were interested in handlebar mustaches in San Francisco, um, this would go a lot better. And this is because when I replace my operations with things that Spark can get sort of more information about, Spark is able to sort of start pipelining these a lot better. So instead of constructing a giant list and shuffling this list around, Spark is able to compute the summary statistic on each individual gnome, and then each gnome just has to tell the other gnomes how many handlebar mustaches are in each zip code. Um, and that's a lot more efficient than having to go to every other gnome and be like, hey, these are all of the handlebar mustaches in San Francisco, because like that's just going to take forever. Um, we get a map side reduction for free, which means that this is 11 kilobytes rather than 48 kilobytes. Um, and that's not like, I mean, kilobytes not ex super exciting, but if we replace that K with a T or even a G, right, like that could, that could make a difference. Um, but the really important part is that like that 48 kilobytes was probably all going to one gnome, like that was all going to the gnome responsible for San Francisco. So we had one very sad gnome, and here, you know, we, we have like one kind of sad gnome, but it's only sad for the number of other gnomes in our cluster, not sad for the number of handlebar mustaches in San Francisco. Um, and it turns out we tend to have more humans than computers, or more records than the number of computers in our cluster. If you have one computer per record in your data processing pipeline, I would love to sell you a support contract. Um, but like, this is not gonna, it's, it's fine if you wanna write your code that way. Um, so the other option is we can, we can spend a lot of time trying to make things work in Spark's RDD API and like taking all of our Lambda expressions, thinking carefully like, oh, I did a group by key and then I had this like reduction afterwards. Can I rewrite my reduction into an aggregate? Or we could just go ahead and use Spark's dataset API. Um, and I really think the dataset API is this really cool piece of magic where, admittedly, I have to give up my like arbitrary Lambda expressions some of the time. I can still use them. But 
I can just like give Spark some hints, and stuff will just work for me. Um, and it's really cool magic, and it's the best kind of magic because I don't have to think about it. Um, so let's look at an example using the Dataset API. Uh, so here I'm interested in figuring out uh, the fuzziness of the happy pandas. Um, and this is really cool because these expressions are mostly data set expressions, but then at the end, because I forgot how to do sum, uh, I just used a reduce. And so this is an arbitrary lambda at the very end, but the first two bits are in Spark's little cool DSL. Um, and I, I mean, trying to convince people to use a DSL is like, you know, trying to sell people handlebar mustache wax. It's a little difficult, but it's really awesome um, because the first bit, like we've got this filter expression where we're looking for happy pandas. Spark is able to do some really awesome things for us. Um, so if I have data about pandas, Spark is able to only load the information about the happy pandas, because it can understand what's happening in here. But if I have a lambda expression inside of there, Spark can't figure out what my condition is. But because we write it in this DSL, like the magical optimizer can take care of it. And the fastest data that I can ever load is the data that I don't load. Um, and the select also means like, Spark will automatically only, if we've got columnar data, will only load the attribute about how fuzzy the pandas are. So if we have a bunch of other information about like where the panda came from, we wouldn't have to load that in from disk either. Um, <coughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and, and if you want to still use your cool arbitrary lambda expressions, you totally can. Um, I do this a lot because it turns out I'm pretty bad at writing things in SQL-like languages, um, and I'm much better at writing Lambda expressions. Uh, and it's really convenient because this map is still distributed across my cluster. All of the existing Spark magic still works, um, and I don't have to switch paradigms or something like that to, to get between the different types of magic. Um, and here's an example in Python for the Python people. Um, it's not as pretty in Python. This part is actually my fault. Um, I've totally been meaning to fix this, but it turns out it's kind of hard to do like static typing in Python. Um, and a lot of the magic that we do involves static typing. So we, we have to be a little bit more verbose in Python to just help spark out. Um, but it's, it's still not too bad, right? Like we, we you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Python users. Um, but it's okay, it's okay. This, this little bit of sadness, right? Like this fact that I have to write this like weird row expression here, like that's not the end of the world. And it's so much faster. It's so much faster. Um, so bigger is bad, smaller is good. Unless you, if you're selling support contracts, totally use group by key uh, if you build by like the CPU cycle. Um, but otherwise, you, you probably actually want to use reduce by key or you want to use data frames, right? And we can see that data frames outperform reduce by key, right? And this is for really simple aggregates. So even, even when I'm writing intelligent things inside of RDDs, things can get a lot faster in Spark's data frames and data sets. Um, yeah, cool. So why is it so much faster? So the really cool thing is that we can sort on the serialized data. Um, previously, when we were doing our sort, we would have to deserialize and reserialize our data for pretty much every step inside of the shuffle in Spark. The, the really important part, though, is that Spark can understand the aggregation that's happening. Um, and this gives it a very space efficient way to store things and also allows the optimizer to do a lot of really cool things. Um, and so what, what can we do in this DSL? So we can do a lot of the things that we're used to doing in Spark. Uh, we can do filters, we can do joins, we can do group buys, um, and we get some new fancy things too. If you want to run arbitrary SQL statements on data frames, that's totally doable. Um, you just have to pretend you're living in the 90s because that's when we picked up the SQL standard from. Um, but if you, if you don't mind a trip back to like SQL 92 land, uh, you, can, you can run arbitrary SQL expressions. Um, and the other thing which you can do now really easily is you can do windowed expressions. Um, and you can, you can totally do all of these things in RDDs, right? They're just really painful to do, right? If I want to compute a window in RDD land, this like magic distribution of my data like it kind of breaks because I have to think about like what happens when one gnome has like 
part of the window that I'd be writing, like it has records one through four, and the other gnome has records four through six, and my window is computed over these two pieces, I have to like think about that. And then the, the really more important part is I have to remember to test that, because even though I thought about it, I probably got it wrong. Or I can just use the window expressions and let Spark SQL take care of it for me. Um, and as someone who has like screwed up writing window expressions on RDDs before, like this is something that I really enjoy doing. Um, there's a long list of the built-in aggregations that work. Uh, if you want to write your own custom aggregations, it's totally supported. Uh, you can go here and see the list. Um, <clears throat> but group by becomes safe, which I think is really important um, because group by key sounds totally reasonable, except for the part where it normally destroys you inside of Spark RDD land because it does terrible things. Um, we can compute multiple aggregates. I know if you're coming from a traditional single C machine background, this is not at all impressive, but when you have to compute three different aggregates inside of a reduced by key step, you end up with like five different variables you're keeping track of, and you really hope you don't screw any of them up. Um, so it, it's, yeah. Uh, there is a catch, though, with everything. Um, it explodes under certain circumstances. Um, so all new magic is not guaranteed to work 100% of the time. Um, if you're doing iterative machine learning, come talk to me and we can talk about how to work around this problem. Um, but there's some extra knobs that you'll have to tune in your Spark cluster to make it really work. But other than that, the magic should be pretty fine. Um, oh, and I promised the conference organizers that I would only have one slide of trying to shamelessly pitch you on a book. Um, so this is the one slide of shamelessly trying to pitch you on a book. You can buy this book. It's about Spark. Um, presumably you're interested in Spark. If you're not, it is a great gift for cats. They love the box it comes in. Um, <clears throat> Uh, please don't return the book afterwards, though. Uh, you definitely want to keep it to remind yourself of the box you got for your cat. Um, and it actually is on print on Amazon as of this morning, so don't, don't, don't worry about it. Although if you want to give me your email address to spam, I always love collecting people's email addresses. Um, there's supposed to be another slide, but really, really that's the most important slide anyways. Um, because my computer just froze, and we'll, so yeah, do, 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 do. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time anyways, right? So does any, do I have time for a question? Uh, very quick one. Does anyone have a super quick question for Boo? No questions. OK, wait, three questions? What? Come on. <clears throat> Make up your mind. So is is it often that uh, you see a situation that you want to rewrite your, your data frame query into RDDs because the optimizer gets it wrong? Totally. That's a really good question. Um, and the answer is not super often. Most of the time when I see this happen, uh, I want to give some more hints to the optimizer because you can, you can give the optimizer a bunch of hints. Um, the times when I normally end up wanting to rewrite it is if uh, I'm doing an iterative graph algorithm or something that looks kind of like an iterative graph algorithm or like SGD or, or something like this. Um, because then the optimizer, even if I give it all the hints in the world, still makes really uh, interesting decisions. Um, but it's, it's normally, normally the answer is give it more hints. Um, and then if you get really stuck, you can always just go back to RDD land. But like, it's not something that I find myself doing super often. Um. All right. Thank you, Holden. Cool. <clears throat>